their way downstairs, I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles as we continue in our sermon series in the book of Isaiah, what I sometimes refer to as the gospel according to Isaiah. We are continuing in this mini-series within the larger book, whereby we are looking at uh, chapters 28 through 33, where the king reigns among the nations, the Lord God, Yahweh, reigning, and we've divided these uh, chapters up, or the text has been divided for us by use of the word ah, sometimes, um, sometimes it is translated woe, woe or ah, the same Hebrew word there, and also to behold. So we're through three ahs and one behold, and we come again to another ah, although this week it is translated woe at the beginning of chapter 31. And chapter 31 really does bleed into chapter 32, but we will be breaking uh, the story up or the, the word that God is speaking to Judah up for uh, our purposes by finishing at the end of chapter 31, just the nine verses, and then we'll pick it up again next week. But I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles, to turn with me, or to take a pew Bible, and I'll invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. And yet he is wise and brings disaster. He does not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the helpers of those who work iniquity. The Egyptians are man and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble, and he who is helped will fall, and they will all perish together. For thus the Lord said to me, as a lion or a young lion growls over his prey, and when a band of shepherds is called out against him, he is not terrified by their shouting or daunted at their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight on Mount Zion and on its hill. Like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will spare and rescue it. Turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. For in that day, everyone shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold in your hands, that which your hands have sinfully made for you. And the Assyrian shall fall by a sword not of man, and a sword not of man shall devour him. And he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in terror, and his officers desert the standard in panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, and whose furnace is in Jerusalem." Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning and we hear your word, we do receive it as Christian scripture and as a word of good news. It is the gospel. It is the story of God overcoming the enemies of God. It is the story of God making things right, bringing all things into their proper order and leading God's people toward their perfection. And Lord, I pray that you would help us today, that we may have the ears to hear and the eyes to see and minds to understand that which you are saying, not only in the words that have been read, but that which you are saying to us today, that your spirit would speak to us and penetrate deep into our hearts to receive your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So, being a Presbyterian was now a disaster. Especially on Wednesday afternoons when at 145 sharp, half of my class went to Hebrew school at Temple Bethel. 
And at 155, the other half went to catechism at St. Adalbert's. This left behind just the Presbyterians, of which there had been three, and now there was one, me. I think Mrs. Baker suspected this when she came to my name on the class roll. Her voice got kind of crackly, like there was a secret code in the static underneath it. Holling Hood Hood, she said. Here, I raised my hand. Hood Hood? Yes. Mrs. Baker sat on the edge of her desk. This should have sent me some kind of message since teachers aren't supposed to sit on the edge of their desk on the first day of classes. There's a rule about that. Hood, hood, she said quietly. She thought for a moment. Does your family attend Temple Bethel, she said. I shook my head. St. Adalbert's then? She asked this kind of hopefully. I shook my head again. So on Wednesday afternoon, you attend neither Hebrew school nor catechism. I nodded. You were here with me? I guess, I said. Mrs. Baker looked hard at me. I think she rolled her eyes. That's when I knew that she hated me. This look came over her face like the sun had winked out and was not going to shine again until next June. And probably that's the same look that came over my face since I felt that way, or the way that you feel just before you throw up, cold and sweaty at the same time, and your stomach's doing things that stomachs aren't supposed to do, and you're wishing, you're really wishing that the ham and cheese and broccoli omelet that your mother made for you for the first day of school had been Cheerios like you really wanted because they come up a whole lot easier and not yellow. If Mrs. Baker was feeling like she was going to throw up too, she didn't show it. She looked down at the class roll. She would call a name, find a hand, and then look at me again. She did this every time she looked up to find somebody's hand. She was watching me because she hated my guts. I walked back home slowly that afternoon. How was your first day, my mother said. Mom, I said. Mrs. Baker hates my guts. That was an excerpt from Gary Schmidt's book, The Wednesday Wars. I had the privilege of meeting uh, Dr. Schmidt a number of years ago at Calvin University for a seminar that I was a part of that had to do with literature and the church. And he shared a little bit of his upbringing, which is alluded to in this book, Wednesday Wars. It's a delightful coming-of-age story about Holling Hood Hood and his seventh grade year with Mrs. Baker and how they came to eventually appreciate and care for one another by the end of the school year because of circumstances around the Vietnam War that brought them together. I can't help but think of Hudson. You need to read this book. You have read it. Okay, good. Did you like it? It was a good book. Maybe it'll be a part of the Academy someday, Dr. Bennett. It's a great book to read. The beginning of the relationship between Mrs. Baker and Holland Hood Hood was rough. It was not an easy or smooth relationship. Smith describes the insecurity and the uncertainty that Holland has at the beginning of the year. Holling is nauseous. His stomach is doing flips and twists and turns. And he starts to feel overwhelmed as this gnawing sensation grows within him. As this doom and, and loom starts to set itself overcast over his body with the assumption that Mrs. Baker really hates his guts. Nothing affects the body. Nothing affects the mind. Nothing affects the soul. Quite like insecurity. And teenage insecurities 
often grow up to be adult insecurities. And as we get older, the temptations to believe falsely, the temptation to believe untruth, to believe the perceptions that are developing in our minds, and to behave in such a way as to try to ensure our own security, the temptation to grasp things by our own power, if left unchecked, can become very strong indeed, very great. Well, there's a situation arising in Judah, a situation that is causing great insecurity among the people of God. And Isaiah is given a word. And he's given a mission by God. He is sent to Judah to speak into that situation. He is sent by Yahweh to speak to the insecurities of that time. And what is it that Isaiah has to say? Isaiah is speaking and telling the people of God, telling Judah, there is only one true lasting remedy for your insecurities. Yes, things look dire. Things look problematic. Perhaps your stomach is twisted into knots. You're feeling the cold sweat. You have significant, if not severe, insecurity about your situation in life. And there is only one true lasting remedy for our insecurities. And that remedy is God. God. Judah is feeling insecure. And Judah is feeling a strong temptation to place its trust in Egypt. But Egypt is a false hope. And Isaiah is saying, you can't feel secure when you are holding on to something that won't deliver. You see, your insecurities are being compounded. You're feeling insecure because there is this threat, but you are feeling even more insecure. If you don't even realize it, I'm here to tell you your insecurities are worse than you think because you're holding on to something, you're grasping for something that will not ultimately deliver you. You cannot hold fast to the truth and you cannot hold fast to God's great deliverance if you are holding on to a lie. There's only one true lasting remedy for our insecurities. It's God. The situation is simple. And Isaiah lays it out simply for the people of Judah. Yes, Judah is under threat by the Assyrian Empire. It is a real threat with real dangers. It is not imaginary. Assyria has been rising in the north and decimating nation after nation after nation. And now Assyria has set its eyes. It has placed a target on Judah and it is coming. And Judah is feeling deeply insecure about its situation. And the people of Judah are looking desperately for relief. They are looking desperately for some reassurance and protection. Now remember, Judah had earlier repudiated God's invitation to trust in him for their protection. You have to go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 7. There is a unity in the scripture. There is a continuity within the story. And let's not forget all the way back in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah comes to King Ahaz who is the king of Judah. And says there is this threat Assyria. But God has come to you and he is going to deliver you. Ask for a sign. Any kind of a sign. 
It can go as high as heaven or as low as the earth below and anything in between. Ask anything and God will give you a sign to reassure you of his protection, of his care, and of his love for you. So what does Ahaz do? Ahaz politely refuses. Oh, I don't want to test the Lord. I, I don't want to ask for a sign. What Ahaz is saying is, we don't want to be obedient to Yahweh. We don't want to have to be submitted to his authority. Instead, we are trusting in ourselves, which is just not sufficient. We are trusting not only in ourselves, we are trusting in idols which is not secure. And we're not only trusting in ourselves and trusting in idols, we are going to put our trust in Egypt, which God says is simply just not smart. Yes, Egypt looks attractive. Yes, Egypt presents itself very well. Yes, there seems to be good reasons and cause for Judah to perhaps put its trust in Egypt. Isaiah names the reasons. He puts it there out in the open. Yes, Egypt possesses brute strength. Go back in your text and look in verse 1 as Isaiah enumerates the reasons why Judah would want to put its trust in Egypt. Yes, they possess the horses. Brute strength. Strength that can just rip things away and demolish and overcome. It's very attractive. Very tempting. Not only do they possess brute strength, but they have resources. And technology, chariots, so many chariots. And if we could just get our hands on some of that technology, if we could just get our hands on some of those chariots, we could be saved. Not only do they have brute strength and resources and technology, they have experts and expertise. They have horsemen that can be rallied and relied upon. And used for our benefit. These become the objects of Judah's hope. And God says, this is not smart. And while the feelings of insecurity are sometimes understandable, sometimes there are legitimate reasons <clears throat> to feel insecure. Assyria was a real nation that had real power and was making real threats. Sometimes the feelings of insecurity are understandable, but they become unacceptable when they motivate us to a misplaced trust. And so Isaiah is going to the people of Judah with a word from the Lord saying, <clears throat> look, this is understandable, but what you are doing, excuse me, <clears throat> what you are doing is unacceptable. And so what is God's response to all this? It's simple. God says, repent. Look at verses six and seven. What does God say? Turn. Return, repent, come back, return to him, return to Yahweh, return to him from whom the people have deeply revolted. The people are revolting against almighty God, but turn back, come back, O children of Israel. For in that day in which you return, everyone shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your hands have sinfully made for you, that you are desperately grasping and clutching to, and the vain hope that it will deliver you. Let them go. Turn back. Let go of your hope in Egypt and come back. Return. Repent and 
believe. Verse 8. And the Assyrian shall fall by a sword, not of man. And the sword, not of man, shall devour him. Who will deliver you from your bondage? Who will deliver you from the threat of Assyria? God says, I will. Repent and believe. Insecurity, according to our text, is a function of idolatry. It is a function of misplaced trust. It is a function of unbelief. And it must be repented of. Turn. Believe. Judah was experiencing tremendous insecurity. And they were experiencing insecurity because there was a national threat. There was a competing national power on the world stage that was encroaching and seeking to dominate the nation of Judah. Now you and I are not experiencing that currently, but that doesn't mean that there aren't many multiple domains of insecurity that you and I face each and every day. <clears throat> Let me name and describe a few for you if I can. How many of us have struggled with physical insecurities? How do I look? Am I attractive or not? Am I beautiful? Am I ugly? Anybody ever love me? How do I feel? How do I feel this morning? What is that weird sensation in the side of my body here? What is that weird sensation that I'm feeling in my chest? Am I healthy? Will I survive the diagnosis? What are my current health conditions? Have you ever felt that before? Have you ever wondered in the night? Have you ever been tempted and struggled with insecurity over your body? What are my immutable physical characteristics? My skin color, my hair color, my height, my weight. Will they be liabilities to my future and my future happiness? What if they keep me from things? What if I don't receive the, the good things that I'm looking for? Will these immutable physical characteristics be a detriment or a benefit to my life? What is the physical ideal and how do I measure up to it? I see all these images before my eyes and I realize I don't look anything like those photos on Instagram. Am I really fearfully? wonderfully made there are the psychological insecurities who am I what is my purpose does anyone love me am I even lovable or maybe I am what I've always believed I'm damaged goods Nobody's going to come around. Perhaps you've struggled with the thought, you know, if people really knew me, if they really knew who I am, if they really knew what I did, they would never accept me. You've asked the question, am I valuable? Does anybody see any value in me? Do I have it in me to succeed? Will I even come close to achieving the, the goals that I desire? Can I win? Sometimes these questions foster a drive. People are motivated as they ask these questions. And other times it makes people crater with insecurity. There are the financial insecurities. Do I have enough money? Do I have access to enough resources? Do we have enough food in the house? 
know that I've asked that question from time to time, especially when we were young and first married and didn't have two pennies to rub together. Do we have enough space in this house? How in the world am I going to pay for college? Right, Todd? Will I have enough to retire? What does the stock market look like today? How many times have we checked it over the course of the last year? Only to shake our heads and go, oh no. Will we make budget in this place? What happens if we don't have enough? What are we going to do? Who are we going to lay off? There's organizational and institutional insecurities. Will I have a job tomorrow? Will my business succeed? Do I have enough inventory? Do I have enough clients? Do I have enough billable hours? Am I going to have to shutter my business? Will the church survive? Will this church survive? Will the church in America survive? Is our community safe? Is our country going in the right direction? And then on top of it all, and perhaps at the base, the, the very foundation of it all, is the spiritual insecurities. The insecurities in which all other insecurities find their origin. Is there a God? Does he know me? Does he love me? Does he care about me? For those of us who are ashamed, we ask the question, what do I do about this secret sin that I'm carrying that nobody knows about and I wish I could be delivered of, but I just can't seem to find any way. For those of us who are proud, who think to ourselves, why is my spiritual genius and righteousness not adequately recognized? Insecurities. Will I go to heaven when I die? Does any of this matter at all? There are lots and lots of opportunities to be insecure. And we're tempted with the belief the world hates my guts. God hates my guts. Insecurities can have a powerful effect upon our hearts and our minds. Insecurities can have an effect on our beliefs. They gnaw and work on our beliefs. What we believe to be true and right and good, our insecurities can start to change what we believe slowly over time. And we adopt that which is not true about God. God hates me. It can start to change what we believe about our neighbor. They're really after me. It can start to affect what we think about ourselves. I'm worthless. Jesus' temptation in the desert, he was experiencing insecurity, food insecurity to be specific. He was hungry and it made him vulnerable in his belief. And the evil one, the devil knew exactly what he was going through. He was hungry and so the devil came to tempt him and said, what is it that you believe if you really are the son of God? Why don't you just turn that stone into bread? It was real and powerful temptation in the midst of real and powerful insecurity. Jesus said, it is written in the scriptures. Man shall not live by bread alone. He believes. Insecurities affect our behaviors our behaviors can start to change when we feel insecure. Change 
what it is that we might do. We might not normally act this way until we start to feel insecure and then all of a sudden things begin to change. I've noticed that feelings of anger can often accompany insecurity. We feel insecure and we get angry about our situation. And we can lash out at other people. We can become erratic in our behavior, coercive, manipulative, because we're insecure. Judas felt insecure about himself. He didn't believe Jesus. He didn't believe who Jesus said he was. He didn't believe in the good works that he was doing. He didn't believe in the leadership that Jesus was providing. And so in an effort to secure himself, he betrays. He betrayed Jesus and he destroys himself. Insecurities can affect our beliefs. Insecurities can affect our behaviors. And insecurities can affect our bottom line. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about our conclusions. I'm talking about our commitments. Insecurity can cause us to commit ourselves to a way of life that is just not true. And contrary to the word of God. Insecurity. It can be understandable, but when it causes us to put our faith and our trust in something other than God, it is unacceptable. Sometimes life is very challenging, and we feel the insecurity, and it's understandable. Or perhaps we've put ourselves in unwise and invulnerable situations, and it results in insecurity. But when our insecurities lead us to idolatry, when our insecurities lead us to unbelief, when our insecurities lead us to place our trust in something other than God and other than the Lord Jesus Christ, then it is, according to God's word, unacceptable. And it's unacceptable because there is a remedy. We are not just invited to repent. In the midst and in the moment of the fierceness of our strongest insecurity, we are not just invited by God as if he's saying, come on to me and and, and turn back to me. No, he commands us to repent. You must turn. Turn your face from that. Turn your back to Egypt and put your eyes on me. Look at me. Trust in me. We are commanded as God's people, as God's children, to look to him, to repent and to believe. And this belief in God must be informed by a true knowledge of who God is. Insecurity is often created by ignorance. Let me say that again. And if you're taking notes, feel free to write it down. Insecurity is often created by ignorance. When we know there is money in the bank, we're not insecure about paying the bills. When we know that we have enough money to cover our bills, we don't feel insecure. Well, when we know who God is and we know what he has done, when we know the Lord Jesus Christ intimately and personally as he's been revealed to us in the scriptures, as we've experienced him in our lives, as we experience him in worship, as we come to him at the Lord's table, when we know Christ and him crucified and we know his death on the cross for me and the life that he gives to me, the exchange that he made whereby he takes on the curse and death and penalty for sin in order that I might have eternal life, when we know that down to our socks we can't we can't be insecure when we know him we are free we are made free from insecurity I know whom I have believed in Paul said I know him 
and I am persuaded that he is able. Do we know him? Do we know who God is? Do we know what he has said and what he has done? Perhaps we know him all too well. We're in rebellion, like Ahaz, who said, Ah, thanks, but no thanks. I can do it by myself. And the result is insecurity. Or perhaps we need to repent because we have forgotten. It's been a long time since we've known the power and the presence and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And we are called, we are commanded to be reacquainted. You see, brothers and sisters, the truth is God does not hate your guts. God does not hate your guts. He loves you. He is calling you. He is calling me. He is calling us to a life of obedience and trust in him in order that we might be secure. And so I leave you with this. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns. It's not Egypt, it's not Assyria, it's not all the things that are warring against you in your life right now. Jesus reigns. Know him and stand secure. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I'm reminded of the great hymn, Jesus shall reign. Where'er the sun, wherever the sun shines, there Jesus shall reign. And so we ask, Lord, that you would be our sunshine. We ask, Lord, that you might reign in our hearts and in our lives, and that through the light of your life, through the light of your word, that we might see, that we might know that we might trust, Lord, help us to repent and to turn our backs on all the things that we think are going to help us to accomplish the goals that we want. Help us, Lord, rather to believe in you, to put our trust in you, to confess, oh, Lord, you know best. You reign. You have saved. and You love me. Help me to live for you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.